name is Cornelia Davis. I'm Senior Director of Technology at Pivotal. And what I want to talk to you about today is multi-cluster Kubernetes. So let's begin. Let's start with the general Kubernetes architecture. Kubernetes, of course, has a whole bunch of nodes. We sometimes call these the worker nodes. And that's where your workloads are going to land. That's where your Docker images are going to land. So we've got a whole bunch of workers. We also have above that, we have what I would consider the control plane. We call these the masters. Sometimes there's one, sometimes there's multiple masters. So this is essentially the control plane. Now, if we dig in at the next level, oh, and I should mention that all of this, these nodes, are running on top of shared compute storage and network. Something that we're all very familiar with comes from VMware. So we've got shared compute, storage, and network. OK? So again, each one of these boxes are VMs that are running on that shared compute storage and network. Now, if we drill into the architecture of Kubernetes a little bit further, what we see is in the control plane, we have things like the API server. We have things like the controller manager, the scheduler, which of course is responsible for scheduling the containers onto the worker nodes, DNS, which is used for service discovery of all of the workloads that are deployed onto the workers. On the worker nodes themselves, we also have some components, things like the kubelet or the kube proxy which is involved in networking. So these are all the various components. And we have the kubelet here, and we have the kube proxy here as well. That lives on each one of the workers. And so these are all of the components. Now, when it comes to actually leveraging this, we're going to take this, just like the shared compute storage and network, these nodes are shared resources as well. And so we're going to share those resources across a bunch of different tenants. So we might have tenant one, which is using some of the capacity across all of these different workers. That's tenant one. And then we also have, let's say, tenant number two. And it's utilizing some of that. And we might have some other tenants here as well. Now, the abstraction that Kubernetes provides for these various tenants is namespaces. So each tenant would get their own namespace. So this is namespace 1, and tenant 2 gets namespace 2. Now this is the basic setup of a, a, a Kubernetes cluster. Now if we take a look at this, though, we talked about these various namespaces and these different tenants, which is really about isolating this shared resource of workers. But if we take a look at the architecture here, what we can see is that there are a whole bunch of components that are shared components. The API server is shared across all of these different tenants. The controller manager is a shared resource. The scheduler is a shared resource, as is DNS, and these various components that live on the workers as well, all shared components. Now, there are some implications of these shared components. The first thing is that because those components are shared across the different tenants, what we end up with is what I would call soft multi-tenancy. And if you take a look at the way that the community talks about it, in fact, the Kubernetes community refers to the tenancy constructs in Kubernetes as really kind of a soft multi-tenancy. See if I can spell that right? And that is because some of these shared resources, something like DNS, is not tenant aware. There's a single DNS. So when tenant one publishes services into DNS, tenant two who's also using the same DNS, 
can in fact see the services that have been published into the DNS by tenant one. So that's really soft multi-tenancy. There's various degrees of tenancy in Kubernetes, but it's relatively soft. The other thing is that when we're doing operational things around this cluster, if I, for example, have to upgrade this cluster, I'm upgrading this entire cluster and it's potentially affecting every single one of my tenants. So ops affects all tenants. Okay. And finally, this is one single Kubernetes cluster. So that one Kubernetes cluster, all of the tenants across it, are using the same version of Kubernetes. So same Kates, as we sometimes call it, version. So tenants one and two are both using version 1.11 of Kubernetes for example. Now this is kind of typical. This is what people typically think of when they think about doing Kubernetes. But what I want to do today is I want to suggest a possibly surprising different way of dealing with Kubernetes in your enterprise. So let's start again with the same basic architecture. We're going to start with the Kubernetes cluster here. And I'm going to draw my workers. And I'm going to draw my control plane. So here's my masters. OK. Now I'm going to do something really interesting here in that I'm going to draw another cluster. If you remember at the beginning, I said that I was going to talk about multi-cluster. So let's get to it. So again, I've got some workers, and I've got a control plane. Now, this control plane, of course, has the API server, it has the controller manager, it has DNS, it has the scheduler, all of those things over here. Now, you'll start to notice something here, that I've got multiple instances of these things. That's really kind of the key. So I've got DNS, and I've got my, my components that are living here on the workers as well. Now, all of this, all of these clusters, these multiple clusters that I have here, are, of course, running over the top of the same shared compute storage and network that we saw over on the other side. So if we take a look at this now, let's look at the advantages of this type of architecture. So for starters, let's think about our tenants now. Where do our tenants live? Well, how about if we do this and we say tenant one gets this cluster and tenant two gets this cluster. So tenancy is not broken up across namespaces as we saw over here at this side. Tenants are broken up across different clusters. So tenant one gets cluster one, and tenant two gets cluster two. Now that's interesting. Now if we think about the things that we looked at over on this side of the board, Let's think about those characteristics as we go now. Notice that I already pointed out that things like the API server and the DNS are no longer shared across different tenants. So the first thing that we'll notice is that if tenant one publishes a service into its DNS, it's not seen by tenant two because tenant two has their own DNS. So the first thing that we get is that you'll notice that what we've done here is we're using virtualization and the hypervisor for hard multi-tenancy. So hypervisor for hard multi-tenancy.
So that's a win right from the beginning. Now the second thing is that you'll notice here that in terms of operations, or even in terms of bad things that can happen, what we're doing is we're limiting the blast radius, if you will. So if I have to do some operations, and I have to, for example, patch the operating system that's running on all of these nodes down here, I can do so on this tenant without affecting this tenant over here. So that's a big one as well. Now the other thing that you can do when you're doing this is that each one of the clusters can have different configurations. A lot of the config that happens in these clusters happens around things like the API server. A lot of configuration is encapsulated in the way that you start the API server or the way that you can start the controller manager. And again, these things are not shared, so you can have different configurations. Another thing that you might have a different configuration on is that tenant one might have workloads that run just fine on standard CPUs, whereas tenant number two might want to run things on GPUs. So that's something that you can do very easily by leveraging the virtualization boundaries as your tenant boundaries. And then finally, the last thing that having independent clusters here can afford us is the ability to have different Kubernetes versions across different tenants. So this tenant could be running version 1.11 of Kubernetes, and this tenant could be running version 1.12. So you can see here that while we think kind of traditionally of having one large Kubernetes cluster, that we've broken down into various namespaces for tenancy, we can see what some of the downsides of that are. But by taking advantage of what we have 20 years of maturity in virtualization technology, we have the ability of affording all sorts of benefits. Now, the final thing that I'll leave you with is, you might be thinking, well, my goodness, are you actually suggesting that I have dozens or maybe hundreds of clusters for different tenants? Because I'm going to have hundreds of different tenants. And that's, in fact, exactly what I'm suggesting, is that you have multiple tenants and many, many tenants, dozens or hundreds of them. Now, you might be thinking, how am I possibly going to be able to manage that? Well, that right there is a big part of the value proposition of Pivotal Container Service. PKS doesn't just provide you a Kubernetes cluster. It provides you a control plane for provisioning and managing sets of Kubernetes clusters so that you can draw your Kubernetes tenancy boundaries along those clusters. I hope this has been helpful, and I thank you for your attention.